I'd like to start with an opening prayer by Reverend Lon. Oh, wise right, turn of God, our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for this crowd who is gathered for one cause and one purpose. We ask that all that we do, that you would be in the midst, and that you would be a blessing to us as we come to share and how we can solve the problem of curbing the violence in our city and in our homes. Bless us now as we move forward and all that we do, that you might get the glory out of all the things that occur in this, tape, in this time, in this place today. We pray, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Reverend. Good morning, everyone. Good On behalf of my co-chair, Judge David Young of the Circuit Court of Baltimore City, the Domestic Violence Outreach Steering Committee, and myself, Judge Karen Friedman of the District Court, I am thrilled to welcome so many of you to the kickoff event for Baltimore's Domestic Violence Faith-Based Initiative. The goal is very simple. We intend to unite the entire faith-based community in taking a stand against domestic violence. During Domestic Violence Awareness Month, specifically October 25th to the 27th, we hope to have every member of the clergy, of every faith, of every denomination, commit to do something in their congregation to raise the awareness of the problem, of the methods of prevention, and of the resources available to those suffering. All you have to do is turn on the news on any random day to know how serious the problem of domestic violence is. What is truly frightening is not just the increase in incidents, but the increased lethality of those incidents. Death from domestic violence is on the rise. Physical abuse, punching, slapping, etc., is seen by some as a regular part of a relationship. I'm sure many of you have seen the woman in the sunglasses in your congregation. In addition to the physical, we must not forget the destructive nature of emotional and mental abuse that eats away at the soul and dignity of a person. All these aspects must be dealt with. Domestic violence is an issue that affects people across the board of all races, ethnicities, religion, socioeconomic, and education levels. For many women and men suffering, their clergy is the first logical place to turn. It is so important for you, the members of the clergy, to be armed with the resources your congregants need. This initiative will help you with that. It is also imperative that the faith-based community unite to deliver a strong message. Every single person deserves to live in their home in peace and safety. And to those of you that are suffering, Baltimore cares about you and there are resources to help. I wanna thank you all so much for being courageous and being leaders in the faith-based community. By being here today, you have shown an understanding of this critical issue, and we look forward to your commitment in October. Please invite your brothers and sisters in the clergy to join you and partner with this initiative so we could send a clear and united message against domestic violence. There are many people I must thank for making this day and this initiative possible. First, Governor Martin O'Malley. When I approached him with this idea, he immediately committed to me the full support of his office without any hesitation. I must also thank First Lady Katie O'Malley, who I will speak about a little bit later, who has always been a leader in the issue of domestic violence. I must also thank my dear friend, our mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake, who I cornered one Sunday at a Ravens game and chewed her ear off about this incredible idea I came up with in the middle of the night. And she was on board right away and offered me the full support of her office as well. So with the cooperative effort of the Governor's Office of Community Initiatives, led by the Executive Director, Izzy Patoka, Tony White, Director of Communications, Elizabeth Hines and Mark Bird, who I've made absolutely crazy every single day leading up to this event, and the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention, along with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods, led by Gus Augustus, and Kevin Slayton, the Mayor's Faith-Based Liaison, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, 
along with our incredible steering committee made up of dedicated staff and volunteers such uh, that are from across the board, from religious leaders to domestic violence advocates and professionals, this initiative was born. Apparently, it takes a village to unite a city. My thanks to all of you that I just listed. The turnout today is thanks to all your hard work and commitment. Talking about hard work and commitment, it's now my, my pleasure to introduce Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Mayor Rawlings Blake has been committed to fighting domestic violence. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice uses city stats to conduct DV stats, which brings together people from all levels of government and nonprofits to address the, the gaps in law enforcement and services for victims of domestic violence. The mayor is determined to make services to victims efficient and effective. With this in mind, the mayor helped lobby the General Assembly to have a law passed this season to have the sheriff's office serve protective orders to make the process faster. She also recognizes that domestic violence is a family issue that affects children who are exposed to this kind of violence. Those children have a hard time in school and carry these issues into adulthood. Like with so many other problems in our community, the mayor gives a voice to the voiceless. I am so proud she is our mayor, and I am so honored that she is my friend. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Brickley. Good morning, everyone. So before I get started, I just want to have a moment of silence. We have lost a giant in the faith community, and um, while the announcement hasn't been po uh, made public, I do want to have a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much for that. So I wanted to thank each of you for taking the time uh, for joining us this morning. I want to thank Judge Friedman for the very kind introduction for uh, being a leader on the issue of domestic violence and uh, certainly um, uh, you know, I count among my blessings having uh, such a friend, a distinguished friend. So thank you for the invitation and you didn't have to chew my ear off. Your husband can tell you it's very hard to say no to Karen Freeman. Uh, so it was an easy, especially since um, he, can, he can also attest, she's right almost all of the time, right? <laughs> no, it is very hard. Uh, Karen has a heart of gold, and uh, beyond having a heart of gold, she is tenacious uh, when she believes in something. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people talk a good game, but she's willing to work uh, her heart out for things she believes in. So it is my pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, I really want to thank uh, the, the governor's office, his entire administration as well for being a, a great partner. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. And this doesn't happen all over uh, the state. Many jurisdictions have uh, attempted to address the issue of domestic violence and engage the faith community. And in some jurisdictions, that call to action fell on deaf ears. I'm very, very proud uh, to look in the audience and see, see this room is filled to capacity. I'm proud of what that means uh, in Baltimore, for Baltimore, and what that means to families that are struggling uh, with domestic violence. I also want to acknowledge um, the office of uh, Senator Mikulski, Michelle Brown. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I know that uh, violence against women in, and um, is, is something that's very important to Senator Mikulski. She's spoken to me about it directly, and I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, have you here, as well as uh, Angela Janice, my uh, director for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you uh, for being here. And I, again, I want to thank uh, Judge Freeman, Judge Young, Judge O'Malley, uh, thank you all for lending your, your voice and your uh, effort to bring about greater awareness to an issue that is far too often brushed under the rug. The idea to enlist the support of faith leaders and to make use of the strong relationship of faith leaders is logical, and I believe it is appropriate. Baltimore has a very strong and diverse faith community, and these institutions stand in the gap consistently, addressing the many concerns of their members. And the reality is, that for far too long and far too often, there has been silence on the issue of domestic violence. 
pastors and pastor and author Miles Monroe suggested that much of this silence is due to a fear of alienating leadership within uh, the institutions of faith. And the church in particular, he argues, has been silent when it comes to the issue of domestic violence. So we gather today in an attempt to faithfully break the silence. We gather to send a mes message to society at large that we as a community will no longer allow our peers to stand silent while the lives of so many are being destroyed. So we must send this message. We must act on behalf of the victims of the 10 domestic homicides that took place in Baltimore last year. City officers responded to more than 22,000 domestic violence calls last year. And unfortunately, those are just the ones we know about. The numbers defy our silence. So in 2011, we announced the creation of DV Stat, which brings together police, prosecutors, victim service organizations, probation officers, and others to create a, strong, a stronger system-wide response to re repeat abusers. These providers meet in City Hall to discuss strategies and to make progress in reducing violence against women. We have to continue to work together to find a way to break the, the cycle of silence, uh, particularly uh, in our faith communities. We must become more sensitive to our internal sign signals that sense chaos and disorder among our friends and congregants. It is our responsibility. You know, the Bible teaches uh, members of my faith that to whom much is given, much is required. And in our hands, in your hands, as, as faith leaders and as leaders in general, we have to set a course and a moral response that is equal to the dangers that many of these families and these women face. The sad, unfortunate truth is that many uh, faith leaders uh, will hardly hear about domestic violence or sexual assault until uh, you yourself speak about it in your uh, official capacity. When you speak about it, we must also be prepared to do something about it, and that's why we're here today. To be of assistance, faith leaders need to understand a few essential steps, next steps when confronted with domestic violence. It's important that each of you understand uh, what is available uh, as resources to, your, to members of your community. How to assess and partner with local advocates and when to avoid a couple's counseling when it would only make matters worse. As pastors, rabbis, and imams, you have the ability to provide spiritual support, scriptural interpretation to support a victim who is seeking safety, and then as a leader, you can be a part of a solution rather than a part of the problem. And so, I wanna thank each of you for your leadership, for your courage uh, to stand with your peers in the, in, as leaders of the faith communities to address, leaders of faith communities to address something that we know in our hearts and in our souls uh, cannot be swept under the rug. Something that must be addressed head on in order to protect women and to protect families and to break the cycle of domestic violence in far too many of our communities. I ask that you would join us in bringing about a greater awareness this coming October during a domestic, a domestic uh, violence awareness month. Again, uh, I'm just so incredibly proud to see so many of you here today. I wanna thank you again uh, for your participation and God bless. Okay, we're going a little bit out of order. It is now my great honor to introduce our First Lady, my friend and colleague, Judge Katie O'Malley. You all know her tremendous efforts on behalf of many causes statewide, specifically her crusade against bullying, which has received national attention. What you may not know is that in her professional capacity, she is a leader and expert in the field of domestic violence. Judge O'Malley has traveled as a guest of the United States State Department to many countries, including Russia and Ukraine, to help educate them about the way that America handles domestic violence. Through her leadership, groups from other countries have come to our courthouse in the city to, to see how our domestic violence system works. Although the laws in this country with regard to domestic violence are certainly not perfect, we are way more progressive and protective than many other countries. 
and Judge O'Malley uses her extensive training and experience to help these countries raise the protections in their laws that help victims. Judge O'Malley trains judges on domestic violence in this country as well. I personally have learned so much from her. It is now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Judge Katie O'Malley. Well, thank you, Judge Friedman. That was very, those very kind remarks. Um, it's incredible to be here and see so many people from our faith community uh, responding to this brilliant idea that Judge Friedman came up with um, almost a year ago, I would imagine. Um, as she said, sometime around midnight, it was in her head. And it, it really is a great idea. I'm so happy she was able to pull this off with the help from the committees, with the mayor's office, with the governor's office, with Judge Young. It's really remarkable. So we really owe a round of applause to everyone that worked on this. Now that I'm 50, I get to wear these beautiful shades, those uh, little glasses to help enhance me here. Well, I'm here today in two capacities. I'm here as the First Lady of our great state of Maryland, and I'm also here as Judge Friedman's colleague in the District Court in Baltimore City for the state of Maryland. The O'Malley-Brown administration um, has had a clear understanding of the importance of domestic violence and its effect on the entire community here in the state of Maryland as well as Baltimore City. One of the O'Malley Brown's uh, 15 goals in their administration was help trying to pr create laws to help end the, uh, the domestic violence and also create laws to better protect the victims of domestic violence. Sadly, Lieutenant Governor Brown in 2009 lost his dear cousin Catherine to a ex-boyfriend. Um, she was only 40, he shot and killed her. So Lieutenant Governor Brown um, forged, along with the um, Governor O'Malley, legislation that did help create some laws that better get handguns out of the hands of these abusers through the protective order system. And that was put into effect after he lost again his dear cousin at the age of 40. I also want to applaud Stephanie Rawlings Blake, our great mayor, on the recent passage of the protective order legislation that goes into effect on January, pardon me, July the 1st. It's a permanent final protective order. If anybody knows about the judicial system, when a, when a victim goes to get a protective order, um, they can get the protective order for only up to a year. Um, they had to show, they had to come back a year later to show that there was still a continuing threat. And there are only certain instances where persons could qualify for a permanent <coughs> order. But now the law will go into effect because of the work that Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake did. She not only encouraged the spirit of cooperation of her office, but the Sheriff's Office, the Baltimore City Police Department, in order to craft a proposal that the General Assembly was able to accept and again pass into law. And that is no small feat if you've ever walk, worked with any of these agencies. Um, so I really want to applaud her for getting that done. And again, that goes into effect July 1st. So that's information, again, that you can give victims of domestic violence. We do need to do more, though, together as strong, we need stronger partnerships within our federal and state governments, our local governments, as well as with the judiciary and our advocacy organizations like the House of Ruth, who does, they do a wonderful job with the court system. Um, as a judge, I'm sure Judge Friedman and Judge Young will agree that we've seen things firsthand, some savage brutality, people who come into the courtrooms telling unbelievable stories of the abuse, physical and mental. We've seen the almost irreversible mental and emotional damage that this has also on children of the victims of domestic violence. Sadly, we've even seen in the state of Maryland many times when an abuser knows that the victim, that the most precious thing to the victim is their children, they sometimes take the lives of their very own children in order to get to the victim. And I can also tell you how difficult it is for a victim to come into a courtroom full of people that they don't know in front of a judge that sometimes I have to say, Sadly, some of my colleagues have been criticized and some have had to leave the bench because of the way they have handled the issues of domestic violence and how they've even further victimized the um, people, the victims of domestic violence. So that's why I really think this is a great idea to get clergy involved because so many times victims of abuse are shamed, they're embarrassed, they don't necessarily trust law enforcement all the time, but they do trust the clergy, they do trust their houses of worship. And by having this initiative, um, and giving our clergy and giving our people of faith the information where these victims can get help, where they can get safety, encouraging them to do that, not necessarily always encouraging marriage counseling, because as Judge Friedman will tell you and Judge Young, uh, 
That's not always the safest thing for these victims. So that we can educate our clergy and our faith-based um, congregations on the ugly nature of domestic violence, then you can be sometimes first, the first help that someone will go to. So again, I really appreciate being involved in this, and if there's anything I can do in the future with this initiative, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. You know I'm gonna take you up on that offer. <laughs> All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce Imam Earl El Amin from the Muslim Community Cultural Center of Baltimore. Um, the Imam has been a very active member of our steering committee and uh, I'm so glad that he has agreed to speak here today. Good morning. Peace be upon you. In the Arabic language we would say, Assalamu alaikum. Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear advocates, all of you, in participating over the past few months in the steering committee, a lot of information has been brought to light to me. But I've always been aware of it. I um, follow our tradition, and in our tradition it says our prophet, prayers and peace be upon him, says, when you see a wrong, there are three things that you do. The first one is you use your hands to stop it. The second one is is to say something about that. And the third thing is, is to just see it and say to yourself, that's not right. But he said, that is the weakest of faith. Just to say, that's not right. So I'm calling you, all of us, to not be a part of those that are the weakest of faith. The ones that just see a thing and just say, that's not right in your heart. But it's time for action, it's time for activity, it's time for advocacy, it's time for those things so we can refer people. Many of us are not qualified. When we see the thing, then we should be able to refer it to someone that is qualified. Pastors, rabbis, imams don't know everything. And I want to say that clearly because I think it's very, very important that we say that. We don't know everything and this isn't some, we can't just presto change your alakazam and it's going to change. It doesn't happen like that. There are processes that we must adhere to, and all of us adhere to that based on the scripture that has been given to us, regardless if it's the Torah, if it's the Bible, if it's the Quran. They're all very, very similar when it comes to oppression. They're all very, very similar when it comes to violence. Because the nature of the human being ultimately is peace. That's the nature of the human being, to strive towards peace. And so I'm going to leave you with this, a quote by the great Frederick Douglass. He said, you are worked on by that which you are working on. And so I'm asking you all to work on this issue that is very, very prevalent in all of our communities. We no longer can sweep it under the rug, and if we're able to, to work diligently and cooperatively in the most diverse place in human history, religiously, culturally, and racially, the United States of America. Thank you, and may God continue to bless all of us. Peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning to you all. <clears throat> I'm a little hoarse yet from Sunday. I want to thank each and every one of you. For those of you who don't know, I have two jobs. In addition to being a judge of the circuit court, I also have the privilege of pastoring a church. So when I say I'm a little hoarse from Sunday, some of you will understand. That's a good thing. I want to thank you all for being here today from the bottom of my heart. And Judge Friedman has already thanked the members of the committee, so I won't repeat them. But um, Reverend Dr. Marshall F. Prentice, who's here today, has a 
saying in a song that they sing in their church. It only takes a spark to get a fire burning. And that is what has happened here. So I truly want to thank Judge Karen Friedman for igniting the spark. She called me about a year ago, and as has been said, she's one who doesn't take no for an answer. But she also demonstrates commitment to those things in which she believes. And so I thank her because she not only ignited the spark, she has, with the help of the other committees and the agencies represented, kept this spark burning. And now we see the success of our efforts. I do want to thank Governor O'Malley. I've closing in on 28 years on the bench. And uh, during his time as governor, we have seen a remarkable commitment as a state to the cause of domestic violence. In four times in 28 years, I've had victims of domestic violence stand before me in court seeking protection. I've done thousands and thousands of cases. For one year, I was the domestic violence judge when I was on the district court. And in one year, I presided over 5,700 domestic violence cases. So I begged the then administrative judge, Ciatola, never put another judge in that situation. It's too stressful and too painful. But four times during my term of the district court, I had victims, all women, appear before me seeking protection from domestic violence. And each of those women was killed by her significant other. That is a remembrance, a painful reminder of what happens all too often in our community. So I know, and I hope you know, that silence is not golden in this situation. All too often, silence is deadly. Maya Angelou says that once people know better, they can do better. And I've seen many abusers after being confronted, some of them after being convicted, and after being counseled, who have changed and who have become advocates and outspoken on the issue of domestic violence. And so my job is to encourage you, but also to enlist you in this initiative. This committee, this meeting represents a first step, but only a first step. If we as a community are going to address, not solve, we can't solve, but we can address the issue of domestic violence. The one thing that I know about people who engage in violent behavior, it is their own pain that leads them to do what they do. Hurt people hurt people. And so when we look around, we see a community and a state and a nation with many hurting people. And we can't heal them, but we can work for healing. And that is my plea to you today to enlist in this effort that we hope will grow and expand throughout our city and throughout our state. At this time, I just want to close. I've been asked to tell you next steps. Um, let me give you a number that I don't think you have. The number is for the governor's office, who, as I said, has done a 
phenomenal job, along with the mayor's office. Uh, Mark Bird is going to be upset <laughs> because he is the number. He is the go-to guy. But he has, he does a fantastic job. I just, I hope Mr. Patapnik and the others in his office, Pataka, know what a great job he does and a great servant of the people he is. But let me give you his number. If you have any questions, you, you want information, please call this number. Tell them what you're interested in. Maybe you don't have to ask for Mark. Somebody else can help you. 410-767-1822. Did I get that right? 410-767-1822. Also, Delegate Glenn is here. And before I do the closing prayer, you're going to hear from her. But the next steps are on October 1st, 2013, at a place to be determined. And if you have not done so, please make sure your contact information is given outside in the hall and you will be contacted. But on October the 1st, there will be an interfaith domestic violence dialogue. Interfaith leaders from across the city will congregate for a panel discussion on how faith communities can address this issue. And then during the week of October 25th to 27th, we're asking all faith leaders to dedicate energy and effort, sermons, teachings, lectures, on the issue of domestic violence within their respective faith communities. Again, let me thank you for being here. It's encouraging. Uh, Judge Friedman, is, she said, well, we haven't gotten that many RSVPs. I said, well, keep on trusting, keep on believing, and keep on praying. And so I thank you for your attendance here today. Thank you so much. I'd like to now introduce Delegate Cheryl Glenn from the 45th District of Baltimore City, who's going to speak about this issue from a very personal angle. Good morning, everyone. It's really an honor and privilege to be able to speak, not just as a delegate, but as a survivor, twice. And, yes. It, it really um, was uplifting in my very first session to have to stand on the floor of the house to talk about my personal experience for the first time ever pu publicly, and that was to help defeat a bill that found its way to the floor that really would have been devastating for victims of domestic violence. And I was put in a situation where you, could, you can't imagine how that felt for the first time to have to stand up on the floor in my first session as a freshman, <laughs> you know? But I said, I have to do this. I mean, I believe God ordained me to be in public service. And we don't know how God is going to use us by whatever methods, but I knew without a doubt that I was supposed to be there at that time and to use my story to help someone. And that's what I was able to do as a survivor and it made a difference and the bill failed. The bill failed and you know how difficult it is to defeat a bill once it comes to the floor after it's made its way through the committee. The bill failed because people respected the fact that I was speaking as a survivor and not as a delegate. But uh, let me just say this, uh, as a child and as an adult, you know, I've had this unfortunate experience, but it's really a gift because I was able to come through it through the grace of God to be able to use that experience. I love mentoring our young people. Whenever I speak to our young people, I can touch them at times where other people can't because I've been through a lot of what they're going through. 
I, I tell people I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> you know, as a result of domestic violence as a child, 13 years old, I was left homeless for a year. So I know how it is for our young people to be on the streets. I take that experience with me in the legislature. So when people talk about our children and how dysfunctional they are sometimes, I say, you got to pull back the, the onion skin. You got to try to figure out why are they dysfunctional? What's going on? And because as a child, I was an angry teenager. I was very, I would fight you as quick as look at you because that was the manifestation of the violence that I was dealing with at home coming out in school, every place else. I didn't even care about school. I, I would have dropped out of school. I tried to, but <laughs> you know, God is good and God uses anybody and anything, you know, and I happened to have a very, um, a very, responsible boyfriend at the time whose father had been a, a minister and at the time I wasn't in church and he was really responsible for keeping me in school. I hooked school over half of the school year. First year in the A course at Western High School. So you can imagine what, what that must have been like. But because of the domestic violence, being homeless, I had to steal to eat. I know what it is to sleep with your coat on to keep from being cold. You know, to not literally not know where your next meal is coming from. That's why I eat anything I want now. Nobody can, no one can tell me anything about what to eat. <laughs> I tell my husband, don't mess with that. <laughs> you know, but as a child, and many of our young people really aren't surviving like they should be. We have a lot of homeless children on the streets. And we are not doing as much as we should be doing in our schools. We talk about sex education all the time, but we don't talk about the real life situations. And, and we have got to start reaching our children at a younger age. Because first of all, violence in your relationship should never be acceptable. If someone hits you one time, they're going to hit you a second time. Don't walk, run. Get out of the relationship. I have a custodial granddaughter who she's graduating from high school, and I talk to her in a real way. You know, I talk to the young people that I mentor from time to time. And I had a, I got an email one time from a young lady uh, last year. I don't know what her situation was, but she said to me, after listening to you, Delegate Glenn, I know I can make it now. And, I, and that, that thing really touched me because you don't know what she was going through. But we have got to, be real with our children. We have to let them know we haven't always been successful. What you see is not what I always was. And my story can help someone else. And what it does too, when you deal with domestic violence, it manifests itself in the way your children are sometimes. You know, it's a you know, trickle down effect. When you're angry as a young person, if you become a mother or a father, then you may not be at that place you should be to be a good, productive parent. You can't teach that which you do not know. And at the time, I wasn't in church. I was very dismissive of church because I didn't know why God put me in such a situation. But um, anyway, getting through that, as an adult, you know what happens? Sometimes you wind up replicating your situation, unfortunately. I married a guy because I didn't want to struggle. I said, I can learn to love it. <laughs> you know, that was a mistake. I still wasn't in church, you know? So I married a guy who was extremely violent. I mean, extremely. Uh, my, my life really could be the making of a movie. And my, my first husband died at the hands of the sawed off shotgun that was up in my temple many a day, many a day. And I just used to pray silently. I said, God, Leave me here till my children get to be 18 years old because nobody's going to love your children like you will. And my husband killed himself. He was drunk one day at the hands of that sawed off shotgun that I begged his family to take away from him. And that's the other side of the coin. When you deal with domestic violence, Families don't respond like they should. Everybody wants to sugarcoat everything. Oh, everything's all right. Y'all just having a disagreement. No, we're not. You know, 
So anyway, he died in the house with my children there, you know, um, on a Sunday afternoon. We, were, we um, stayed with my sister on her floor, on her carpeted floor. Two children, and my, I had three children, two, my two daughters and my stepdaughter, for about eight months until I could get my own place. But it's all good, because that experience will never, ever leave me. I thank God now, because I say, you know what? As a legislator, I've been at both ends of the spectrum. There's nothing I can be bribed with. There's nothing I can be intimidated with. I'm there to serve. <laughs> I have, you know, I've been at both ends. So there's nothing you can do with me, <laughs> you know. But it's all good because it helps me understand I can talk to anybody. I can still go back to East Baltimore where I grew up. I can walk those streets. I'm not afraid to. I can talk to anybody, anywhere, no matter what level of life you're in. And I can reach you. I can connect with you because I understand. You never know what a person's story is, you know, until you care enough to try to look into it. But um, as an adult, you know, I'm, I can tell you I'm blessed now. I have a wonderful husband, Ben Glenn. <laughs> We've been married 23 years, and he is a blessing. But I met him after I went back to church. After I turned, I said, I said, Lord, <laughs> after marriage number two failed, <laughs> I said, I got to do something different. I went back to church. This is no lie. I went back to church, became a tither for the first time in my life. The first time. And then we started going to Living Word. Uh, I, that's where my husband worshiped. And I will tell you, I have never looked back, but I never will forget. But we as a society have to do a much better job to reach our young people when they are most reachable, and that's when they're young, to tell them what to expect, what is acceptable, what is not, and if it's not right, don't walk, run, get out of it. Don't try to change anybody. Don't try to say, oh, well, he's going to be all right, or she's going to be, no, get out. Because too many people, we, every year in the General Assembly, we recognize victims who are deceased. And it's by the grace of God that I'm still here today. So I just thank you. I don't want to take um, any more time, but I'm here. And anytime I can be helpful, Anytime I can do anything on this subject, I'm there. I'm not ashamed. I'm very proud of my success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delegate Glenn, for sharing your story. You know, it just proves what I was saying at the beginning. I'm sure many of you know Delegate Glenn or know of her, and you would have never have known what she has gone through. So this is an issue that you, you know, affects everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter you know, where you're from. This is something that across the board affects our community. And thank you so much for your courage and, and being outspoken on this issue. I want to just introduce now Reverend Dr. Karen Bethia, who's going to give us our closing prayer. Just before we pray, I want to say thank you to Judge Freeman and the whole committee for bringing this to the attention of the faith-based faith community. There is so much we can do when we come together. We have a voice, we have a platform, and we absolutely can make a difference because of the influence that God has blessed us with. So can we stand and join hands? Amen. Let us pray. Father, because wise men still seek you, we come to you today. Prayer is a place where burdens change shoulders. Prayer is a place where humanity meets with divinity. God, we thank you for this beautiful day and that we have been awakened to fresh mercies that you provide. We thank you for this gathering where we have come together to work together on an issue of significance. We are so much stronger together than we are apart. And we now ask you to place a hedge of protection around men and women who are in the situation of domestic violence. Give us the tools that will cause us to collectively address this unacceptable ill. Give us the sensitivity to care, even if we have not been personally affected. And we thank you in advance for the wisdom 
and discretion that it will take to address the fear around this topic. This is our prayer. Thank you for hearing us and assisting us. And thank you for all who have gathered here today in the spirit of unity. Amen. Amen.